Hello, everybody, and welcome to Dream Drop Long Distance, a podcast about two best friends who have nothing better to do than skateboard around a, a sunset village and eat sea salt ice cream. <laughs> How are you doing today, Mitchell? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. I'm doing very good. I wish I had some sea salt ice cream right now. It sounds really good. Right? That was always one of my like dreams as a kid. I wanted to to try sea salt ice cream, know what it tastes like. I've I've never seen it. It sounds good though. I I think at some point I've had like a sea salt sherbet kind of thing and maybe like, you know, uh like sea salt caramel, but never just like that blue like sky blue sea salt whatever they call like their ice cream and it oh yeah i agree it always was just like make my mouth water i was just like i want some of this so bad yeah i mean the closest i've had is like salted caramel or uh like putting pretzel pieces in ice cream instead i've never had sea salt it sounds so good i I mean it's probably awful but I'd, i'd still like to try it anyway yeah also oh my god pretzels and ice cream slaps so good Right. A little chocolate. Anyway, we're getting anyway. We are. Uh, so <laughs> last we left off, uh, we were in control of this new character whose name is Roxas. And uh, he has wielded a keyblade, doesn't know what it's called, and uh, is having these dreams and visions of who we know to be Sora. But he's kind of confused about all that, I, I believe. Yeah, at the end of day one, we go into some flashbacks of what Roxas is now seeing as a lot of the moments from Kingdom Hearts 1 where we got to Traverse Town. And we see that Sora, at the time that Sora got the Keyblade, at which point Roxas actually wakes up. And I put in a line, he kind of looks at his hand and he goes, a key blade? Yeah. And that, so you... I was like, oh, he now he actually knows what it is called. He's able to remember it from the dream, which is cool. It it shows that, yes, he's thoroughly remembering all of these things. And as he's kind of like walking out of his bedroom, he uh, he picks a stick up off the ground and starts swinging it around, pretending it's a keyblade and uh, throws it behind him and hits this uh, hits a hooded figure. I thought that was so funny. He was yeah, he's just sitting there going like kind of like change change all right this isn't working throws and they do kind of like a little horror movie trope where they just show some hooded figure standing behind him and he accidentally hit him with it and i was like ah (laughs) right yeah just like oh god where did he come from oh no roxas is in some serious trouble now but the hooded figure just kind of walks off and doesn't make anything of it We, we don't even learn who this really is though i have a guess yeah, but but it's obviously now we know that somebody is watching him from the shadows, but even though he seemed to be pretty apparent there. Right. So moving on from there, uh, Roxas and his friends, they go sit down and they eat ice cream. And I want to say maybe Pence says, or maybe it's Roxas. One of them says, uh, do you think we'll always be together? And just that moment with these kids hanging out eating ice cream enjoying their summer vacation and just being young right it it just encapsulated this golden moment in time that is never meant to last I, i i wish that i could recapture the magic of of being a child and playing video games with my friends without the worries of bills and work that moment did hit a little differently back in the day uh, I remember because sp- even now, when you think about it like that, I, I don't know, you've probably seen that idea. So many people talk about like at some point you and your friends had your last summer, like th- your last day of summer together. And then you didn't have another one, but you don't really remember what it was. And that thought immediately translated here where he's just like. I mean, do y'all think we're just going to keep doing this or is this kind of like going to run out? I forget exactly who brings up the idea, uh, but somebody, one of the friends says like, well, you know, why don't we make the best of it? Because we've only got a couple days left and we try to w- let's take a trip to the beach. So with the idea of going to the beach, though, they can't really do that without having money. And because these are kids who don't have money 
and don't have jobs and all that sort of thing. So uh, they decide to go pick up some odd jobs around town. Yeah, no, so the the Twilight Town Center, now that you've returned all of the photos, they seem to actually want to talk to Roxas and his friends again. And there are the, yeah, like you said, there are these two job boards that uh, give you little, you know, jobs where you can get paid. If you do decently well in terms of time, you get, I think it's 30 money. And if you do what they consider, like, really good then I think they give you 50. With the exception of one job, poster duty, which if you do really well, actually gives you 100, which makes sense because it, it's the longest job that there that there is. It is. And it also requires you to run around the map way more than any of the other ones. So do you want to uh, dive into this? Because honestly, this is one of our favorite things about playing these games and doing this podcast is goofy little mini games that they decided to put in Kingdom Hearts. Uh, normally. It's all about 100 Acre Wood, 100 Acre Wood. So excited for 100 Acre Wood. But in Kingdom Hearts 2, they introduced even more mini games. So we've got six brand new mini games that we get to compete for the victory on, upon. We do. We do. And uh, I guess we should talk. So the the first three. So you have um, the, this uh, this mini game where you deliver letters. And one thing we forgot to mention is that... Uh, Apparently, Roxas, for some reason, is like on a Tony Hawk level of skateboarding knowledge and skill. Like this kid can shred. And the, one of the, the very first mini game is the post office is like, hey, I've got five letters I need you to deliver to these townsfolk. And then a, a pigeon, like two pigeons for some reason. Yeah, I didn't understand that one. You got to throw a letter at the carrier pigeon for it to carry away somewhere else, perhaps. Or maybe the pigeons can read in this world. I choose not to think too hard about it. Yeah. And it so that's your your goal is to uh, figure out how to skateboard down this hill and deliver as fast as possible to as to all five people or and, you know, birds as quickly as possible. So before we get into the scores that we got for this, which I'm really excited to hear, I just want to, again, thump on how strange it is that Roxas is this good at skateboarding. Like, if Kingdom Hearts 2 was made even one decade later, there is not a chance in heck that there would be any sort of skateboarding anywhere in this game. This no, only not at all. happened because of the the remaining hype behind the Tony Hawk series, as you were suggesting. You know, each individual button gave you like, you know, 360 nose grab, um, like Ollie. So it was like, it's not like, you know, it's I, I, I've i never been a skateboarder myself. But the fact that they give you multiple options when you're just skating and also when you're jumping or doing something out of grinding down a rail. I was like, I was like, they, why do we have this many options for skateboarding in this game? I mean, so it might be a spoiler to say this, but there's a full skateboarding mini game later in the game, like more intense than, than anything in these little mini games. Ah, uh, okay. That kind of, I guess that makes more sense. So they're just giving you a little teaser. Yeah. Getting you comfortable with it. And it's a nice way to move around the map quickly. I, I appreciate twilight town for offering this way to these maps are huge just here here's a way to get to the other side as quick as possible yeah i mean they give you that and also i mean you can hop on top of the the train and it, it, you know it's not a direct route but it'll get you to places decently quick because the map is rather large so anyway that's enough of a, of a diversion so no, no. tell me mitchell how did you do on this mail delivery now mind you uh we I imagine that we played this each of these mini games multiple times and competed for better scores. Like, there's no way that we only played each of these once. Of course, per usual. Okay, first game up. I the best score I was able to get. I tried my hardest. I was able to deliver all of the letters in nine point five seconds. <laughs> oh, Mitchell, you poor, poor lad. My best score, and I saved a clip of it because just in case you wouldn't believe me, my best score was 7.71 seconds. I, you're going to have to put that. So I, you have to send that to me. We're going to put it up because I don't know if I, but that is, I don't know how. I, I, I was trying to cut time in corners in so many areas, and I have no clue how you got seven seconds. Yeah. So on that ramp, as you're coming down, like the final ramp, 
you can jump off of it at the right time to get up to that pigeon. And if you turn around at the right time, you can kind of like cut the corner and cut even more time to like land almost exactly where the final person is. Ugh, the pigeon, the pigeons would screwed me every time because it never, it was, it, it goes in that complete circle. So you kind of just had to hope and anticipate that it was going to be in a direct line to you. I missed it probably three quarters of the time. Really? Oh man. I used to, well, back the last time that I did a replay of this game, I ended up practicing this particular one so much just because I knew like, okay, this is the shortest time out of any of the mini games, which means this is going to be the most efficient way to get money. So let me just do this, bum rush through it, get my money and get going. Well, okay. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. Zero to one. <laughs> anyway, uh, the second mini game is a, a local guy who's like, hey, my back's hurting. I need you to help me push this wagon full of stuff up this probably 60 degree hill and it, get it into this garage. The thing is, though, you get it up there by hitting it with sword combos. Yeah. So what happens is uh, each hit uh, just kind of like knocks it up a little bit farther, but it also does take directionality into account. So if you're directly behind, it goes a little bit farther. Or if you're a little to the left or to the right, the wagon will move a little to the left or to the right. And sometimes when you land a full combo or you land a combo finisher, the cart will hop up into the air which is a dangerous moment because either it's going to land back down on you, cause damage and roll back down the hill, or you can knock it in that moment and really ram it forward. Yeah, you just don't want to miss that hit because the moment it knocks you back down the hill, you might as well just restart. Like your time is kind of screwed after that. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, on this particular one, I, got, I put a couple good practice rounds in, but I didn't do over the top like I did on, on mail delivery. So on cargo climb, I managed to get a score of 27.91 seconds. Dude, go whatever. Okay. <sighs> All right. I, the best I could get was 32. Um, and that was on multiple, I'd say probably f six or seven tries. I don't know. I, I couldn't get, sometimes the angle, I couldn't, I, I think I would be doing a good run. The angle would get off or I wouldn't be able to hit that last combo on one of them. Anyway, I don't want to talk too in depth about this one, so we're just <laughs> going to say Owen, Owen two, whatever. Um, I'm sorry to be embarrassing you in front of your uh, in front of your brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anywho, um, the last event, um, Roxas is hired by a local girl, as she has it's kind of like an entertainment business, I guess, where her entire thing is, "Hey, I need you to juggle this ball in the air." But the way you juggle the ball in the air is by hitting it with your sword. And usually some kind of combo. And the longer, the more hits you keep it in the air, it basically just keeps track of how many times you can volley it. And there's a few other tricks that you can do here, too. Like I noticed that um, some of the walls that you could hit the ball into, it would tick, 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 hit a couple times. Uh, I wasn't yeah. I couldn't re reliably trigger that or at least not in the spot that I would have wanted to do so. But uh yeah. How did you do on this one? I, I, I used to struggle with this one a lot. Like when I was a kid, I could barely get over 10. So this one, I feel like I competed pretty well and I did clip it. Or I did take a, a photo because I didn't know if you'd believe me either. Uh, my max combo was 185. <laughs> <laughs> Holy jeez. OK, I, yeah, I uh, it's a big L for me, big L for me. I wanted I wanted 200 so bad. And I think when I was when I got to that number, I remember I accidentally hit the corner of the ramp that we were right next to. And I was just like, I'm just going to I'm just going to end it here because I'm never going to get back to that. This is probably the biggest W that you're going to get out of me. Uh, my my score on this, because apparently I'm still bad at this minigame is 37. Sheesh. OK. I will take that one. Yeah, the best I could do was like try and get it into that little uh, hallway where the gate kind of is. I don't know if hallway mm -hmm. is the right word, but there's like a, there's a tight two buildings. And I'm like, OK, cool. Ball can't get far. I'll just try and hit it. I was struggling. I, <laughs> I could not do well in this game. Never have. Apparently never will. 
I was able to find a way to work it into like two or three corners to just keep going. And occasionally it would go over my head and I would have to kind of like redirect it again. But yeah, I mean, I sat there and did that for probably 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm terrified. I just, I'll just say, I'll just say it. I'm terrified. I, I can't even picture that. I, I wish you had taken a video so I could see this in action. Like I need to see a master at work. Apparently I, I wow, I'm impressed. I'll, I'll say it. I'm impressed. Well, like I said, I got a photo of the score um, and we'll we'll probably put we'll figure out a way to post our both of our collective more ridiculous um, results so people can people can see that we're not fibbing. Gosh, could you imagine the stakes? Like, could you imagine lying about something like that in such a low stakes environment? Like, no, it does, it does, it's so silly, but I'm still going to post it anyway, because I was like 7.7 .7 seconds. I'm proud of that one. Let me get a clip. And I was like. I did that when I got below, um, when I got below nine seconds, I was like, yeah, I did good. That was really awesome. And then I just did it a couple more times because I was trying to make more money. And then I'm like, oh my God, below eight seconds. And I just clipped it again. So yeah. seriously, I have no idea how you did that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so after that, you move on. There's a second, uh, bounty board or second job board out in, um, I believe the area is called Tram Common, maybe. I don't know. It's the big, the big open area of Twilight Town. There's a second one there, and all the mini games take place there. The first and probably hardest mini game, the one that takes the absolute longest out of any of them, is Poster Duty, where you are tasked with advertising for the upcoming struggle tournament. More on that later, folks. <laughs> You're advertising for the struggle tournament by running around this enormous map and slapping posters onto a wall. Just smack, smack, smack. Uh, the whole goal here is to find an efficient route to put, I believe it's 20, it might be 30, I can't remember, but the, uh, a certain no, amount. No, I, I think it was 20. Okay, 20. Putting 20 posters up onto the walls with Roxas's limited jumping abilities and just kind of doing that as quickly as possible. So with that... I managed to do this. It took me a good couple tries to get it done. I had to find some efficient routes, and I was like, okay, I have got to get below one minute. I don't feel happy if I'm not below one minute. So I got 57.48 seconds. Ooh. Okay. Well, uh, my best was a minute 17. I just, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of, a lot of time. I, I did probably six, seven attempts, and I thought I found a good route, and I just, I couldn't get any lower than that. There were also a, a a lot of times where I was like, oh, I'm doing really good on time and it would fall off a building. Oh, no. And I was just, and I was just like, well, you know, this is written in the stars. I'm not getting any better than this. Yeah, it was one of those things where I kind of just like went left a little bit first, got like those two, I think, that are right there and then went right, mm -hmm. jumped across the jumped across the rooftops. And I don't know, it, it was a it wasn't like too complicated of a route, but I was like, oh, man, I got to get below a minute. I, I am so sure I have to get below a minute. Well, bravo, because right now, as of right now, you're up three to one. And unless I can sweep the next two, I think it's possible. You are you are our current. I mean, you already are our current mini game champion, but I'd like to at least end this at a tie. Sure, sure. The Roxas mini game champion, after all. Let's see. All right. Uh, the next one is Bumble Buster which involves fighting honeybees or very, very angry bees in an alley. Uh, they take out switchblades and they try and shank you. It's really uh -huh. not okay. I don't know how this made it into a Disney game. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you, you, all you have to do is smack these, uh, smack these bees. But the trick is, I believe, two normal hits will knock one out, as will a combo finisher. Mm -hmm. So if you can get two hits and then your third hit knocks something else, then that's an efficient way of doing things. Uh, I struggled on this one for a little bit. I couldn't get below like 20 seconds. And then one run, I got really lucky. The bees all kind of clumped together just right. And I managed to do it in 10.98 seconds. Oh, go away. <laughs> ah, I, I thought I did pretty good. You, when you said you couldn't do better than 20, I was like, all right. 17 might do it because I felt like I, I, I was I did the same thing where I got a couple of good clumps of bees in there and I was taking out like two or three at a time. OK, 17 seconds was my best. Moving on. I'm so sorry, Mitchell. I'm so sorry. I'm not that sorry. Damn it. Dear listeners, I am not that sorry. No, I mean, I am. Sorry. Ah. The final minigame 
Not that it matters now. The champ is re- okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so the final mini game is Junk Sweep. I did not like this one too terribly much. Uh, it's basically there are a bunch of boxes all in I think the same alleyway. Then you need mm-hmm. to knock a box into another box to destroy boxes, and uh, all you're trying to do is do it in as few swings of the keyblade as possible. But even then, swings isn't quite the right word because if your keyblade touches a box, that counts as a hit. So if you make one swing and hit two boxes with that one swing, that's two hits. You can hit one into another and kind of like, maybe not a chain reaction, but at the very least knock out a a bunch that way. I think that if somebody really wanted to, they could get this down as low as like three hits because you just do one combo. Uh, I did not do that. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, Because I don't know if you noticed, Mitch, but you can actually push the boxes too. like you were able to kind of freely move them. So you could like really line it up if you put the five minutes into it. And I did one time I did just like push boxes together for a little while and I got a worse score instead of a better one. So I don't know. How how did you how did you do here? How did you do here? (laughs) Okay, so I I I didn't do a lot of I, I just kind of worked angles. I was like, all right, three that way, two that way, three that way. They would kind of hit into each other. I got 10 swings. I swear to you, this was my first play. I didn't move any boxes. I just swung wildly to to see how the game worked. I was never able to do okay. it again. Seven hits. Oh, whatever. Okay. Uh, congratulations, Kyle. The end of the Roxas video game master. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Anyway, Kyle's better than me at mini games, everybody. Per usual. Any okay, but no, seriously, great job. And to you, I to admit you, that, that grandstander score that you got is impressive. I, I don't care about most of these other mini games. I'm impressed with grandstander. That that's hard. Mm, I, I consider that thanks. impressive. Well, th- thank you. I'll take my, I take my, you know, my one win with a, a modicum of pride. So anyway, with that, uh, you can choose at any time once you've earned enough money, you can choose to go turn it in to uh, go talk to your friends and turn it in. Uh, Did you do that or did you let the game stop you, physically stop you from making more money? Oh, no, I mean, I just went and turned it after I did a couple. I just went and turned it in because I was I was more excited to uh, to keep playing the game. Oh, well, you see, you missed out, actually, because the amount of money that you earn changes a very small thing. Uh, as I recall, the, I think you only got one AP for turning it in early. Did you, did you at least make enough Hmm. for the watermelon? Watermelon. You can, you can earn extra money and you, your, your friends can buy a watermelon. I, I don't think so. Okay. So, I mean, I want to say I earned probably like five or 600. Okay. Yeah. So if you had, uh, turned in at a higher number or just kept playing until the game stops you, which is at 2000 money, you get <laughs> two AP where I think, I think oh. maybe only got one. I don't know. Maybe I didn't realize that was a thing. Mm-hmm. JRPGs be like that, man. Dog on it. Well, okay. That's I'm already behind. So with that, uh, at whatever amount of money that you decide to turn in, you uh, you go to uh, the train station, and uh, what happens there, Mitchell? The um, the kids are like, "Oh, we have enough money to buy tickets to go on this trip." And as they're about to walk up the stairs, Roxas gets tripped up and picked up by a hooded figure. And uh, as the guy is like grabbing him off the ground, he tells him, "Can you feel Sora?" Roxas is kind of like, "What?" And his friends look at him like, dude, what are you doing? And he looks and the guy is gone. Worse, his friends don't see that any of this happened. So they gaslight him about it, too. Yeah, they're just they are just like, what are you talking like? He's like, did y'all not see the the guy? And they're like, what guy? So so Roxas is the only one that just saw all this go down. And he's kind of like, "Okay, I guess that was not a thing. And they go to buy the, the tickets. And um, Alette is like, OK, give me the money. I'll buy the tickets. And Roxas realizes that not only did they not see this guy, they also didn't see the fact that this guy just stole all of their money. 
All of it. Like, that's so rude. Stealing from children. That's who who does this? Yeah. And so, of course, they're like, wow, well, man, that's that's disappointing. And of course, Roxas is just like feels like he has failed his friends and now they can't go on their beach trip. And yeah, it's it was kind of a sad moment. You could tell that was supposed to be like their big end of summer friendship day that now is just not going to happen. And instead, uh, what we see is what really happened, which is that the hooded figure is in Diz's office or whatever you want to call it, his lair, uh, his, mm-hmm. his computer station. And uh, Diz explains that the reason why they couldn't go to the beach is because it would create another entry point. Uh, in fact, specifically, the hooded figure asks, is it really that hard to make a beach? Which... With the knowledge of being an adult who can take the time and think about the things that are being said, uh, and the, the numbers have been flashing on screen, and the fact that a keyblade, uh, digivolved into place, as you put it, uh, uh-huh. Roxas has got to be in a digital world, like a, a, a fake version of Twilight Town. Like, we have enough clues at this point to put that together. I don't, as a kid, never saw any of this, but like, it's kind of obvious now, all, all the way here at day two, they've been putting the, putting the seeds down for that. Yeah, I mean, and even I think at one point the hooded figure is playing with the money bag and he's kind of Diz kind of looks at him like you had to steal that. He's like, well, you told me we had to keep items out of the real world. I'm still I'm, I'm not sure how Diz is able to do that, because uh, uh, clearly, you know, they must not be in the digital world when they're saying that. Yeah. And yet, you know, there is a physical object that was in the digital Twilight Town. They're in the physical world. I don't know how that's possible. I mean, I don't think they really like explain that or talk about that in any of the what kind of computer wizard must Diz be, you know? I I mean, it's got a very Truman Show vibe. Oh, you know, that's a good point, too. Yeah, it does kind of have a little bit of that because but it, in that case, though, the, the Truman Show was physically real. But like, I, I don't know. That's a good analogy, though. I really like that. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. Um, but then we are, we are greeted by, um, the next, uh, signifier in, in terms of whatever is being restored. And it says, uh, restoration at 28%. And in so doing, we see flashbacks of almost every world that Sora has been to Atlantica, Olympus, Agrabah, Halloween Town, Monstro, Neverland, and Hundred Acre Wood. And we get to see... Roxas kind of connects in a weird way with Namine. We said we also, this is the first cut cut scene that we start to see hazy memories of Kyrie in them. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, because Kyrie's been kind of disconnected from all of this, which mm-hmm. is so interesting. And and I I mean, I guess that was kind of the original thing that Namine stole from Sora, though, right? And that was what needed to be restored to him in the flower pod, right? Like finding that, finding that inner light, which is Kyrie, finding that light of Kyrie would shine onto all the other ones, right? Hmm. Yeah. And it gives you that, that glimpse of that relationship and what it was. But I, what I, the reason I brought up the Kyrie part is because right after that, we see Namine outside of the pod that as you know, as we played Chain of Memories, you remember at the end of Chain of Memories, you think that that's the pod that Sora is currently sleeping in. And you hear Roxas's voice go, who are you? And she just smiles at him. And that's it. It's really fascinating because that means it must have actually played out, perhaps, that that Namine and Roxas really did connect in some way or that Roxas was ethereally present in that room with Namine, or there's no telling really because Namine's a, a witch as Diz called her at one point I believe so there, there's no telling mm-hmm. whether that scene is real or not who knows who knows um but he does wake up and he you know I think he he goes to leave and who's in the room interestingly um wasn't it Namine? Namine was kind of like in the room right yeah, I had, the note I put down is so he gets up and he kind of is like trying to figure out what just happened. And he goes, he leaves the room and inside the room is like that ghost 
Namine, that like kind of almost see through version of her that we've seen in a couple other iterations. Which is just terrifying. Like that's some some genuine Japanese style horror right there in its own way. Like that spot on. I like it. It was pretty funny. I was just, I kind of was just like, what are you doing here? Listen, Roxas and Namine are meant to be. I'll, I'll just say it right now. OK, Roxas and Namine were meant to be. OK, OK. I mean, I was kind of I, I was before this. I was kind of I was kind of putting her and Repliku on the same boat. But we'll see what happens. I mean, Repliku is dead, I think, probably. I know. I know. Sad day. Spoilers. Sorry if anybody didn't listen to that epi- those episodes yet. But anyway, I don't know. Yeah, you, you should go back. You should go back. You should, you should go back and listen. But if they haven't listened to it, they wouldn't know what Repliku means. So, because we coined that one, trademark, Dream Drop Long Distance 2022 or 2023. Yes, sir. Should be 2020. At this point, 2022. No, it's 2020. 2023. Yeah. Who, what, are, what is time? Uh, I don't know. Who, when is this episode even going to air? It could be 2024 for all we know. All right. I'm going to stop rambling. No, I mean, we technically live in a digital world. So uh, anyway, it is day three, everybody. We are currently on day three in Twilight Town. Give it up for day 15. <clears throat> so on the third day, Roxas goes to meet his friends and finds a note left behind that apparently they're going to try once again to go to the beach. This time, Hainer's like, forget about the money. We're just going to go, which is just weird to me that uh, if this is a digital world, that it's somehow disobeying Diz's uh, will, as it were, because the, the, they're just going to try and go to the beach anyway, which makes me wonder what would happen when they tried to do it, because we never get to find out what would happen if they tried to do it, because the simulation, let's say, the everything around Roxas, time, as it were, stands still, and Namine appears before him. She does. And it's like her, his friends come up to him to try to say something. And he realizes everything is just suspended in suspended in time. And Namine is there and she looks at him and goes, I just wanted to meet you at least once. Which is kind of ominous, because if I hear that, I'd be like, wait, first of all, this is the first time we're meeting. Second of all, why does it only have to be once? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Like, what is going to happen to Roxas? Why does Namine believe that Roxas is not going to be available for her to meet again later. Yeah, but then she just walks away and time starts right back up. Which is strange, for one thing, but also Roxas's friends make no notice. They do not notice that Roxas is not standing in the same spot that he was or facing the same direction that he was a moment ago. Weird stuff happens in front of them, does not face them. I mean, I guess it's not the first time because the hooded figure was not visible to them but we know that the the nobody was so i don't know there's there's a lot of weird stuff happening here yeah but we actually we run after where we think that she's going and we wind up running into nobodies while chasing after her yeah and instead he ends up going into the sand lot where cypher and his gang see roxas being chased by these nobodies and they go to fight them. And there's like a whole, um, like you could tell, like the gang is obviously Cypher is not wanting to back down because he's just like, I, you know, I'm the toughest fighter in town. Like, I'll I'll help. Like, we'll take these things down. And his friends are just like, yes, what Cypher said. Yeah, man. You know, let's get him, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, and so. You're trying to beat these things, and you and Cypher both realize you can't hit them. I can't hit these things, you know? <laughs> and from out of nowhere, you hear Namine's voice yell, Roxas, use the Keyblade. Use the Keyblade, you know? Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And so, it, Roxas is kind of like, what? And you get, ch- and nobody charges at Roxas, and then before it can hit, we disappear into... Just this this light, this pure void of white light. And where do we go, Kyle? Surprisingly enough, we end up in a dive to the heart. And in this case, instead of seeing uh, princesses on the stained glass floors that are so familiar to this scene, we see uh, images of Sora, Donald and Goofy. 
Do we see? Is it only Zora Dawn and Goofy? Because I thought I thought we also saw Kyrie and Riku as well. They might be on like smaller circles inside of it, but I know that like the main image on all of them, it was always the same, just a different color. And mm. Sora was the main guy. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Um, but I couldn't remember because they have a couple, the smaller ones, and I thought I thought the other two were in there as well. That, Probably wrong. That might be. But, I don't know. I'd have yeah. to go look at it, and I don't feel like it. It's a we're in a podcast. Mm, it's no, fine. Yeah. I can't just throw an image up. No, nah, you're good. But um, yeah, to anybody or to everybody listening, yeah, it, this is the um the very iconic black void, uh, stained glass, circular arena. Not arena, but like a a platform it, that just falls into nothing uh, that we have had in every game so far, and um, we no, are in no. I don't believe. Did we that. not have it in Chain of Memories? There was not. There was not a dive to the heart in Chain of Memories. Not that I remember. Oh, I could have sworn I thought there was. I I might be wrong. I, we'll have to go look. There, I mean, there's definitely one in Kingdom Hearts One. Sure, absolutely. And, and it, this is such an iconic scene. I, but I will say, it doesn't like awe me the way that it used to i i used to just be enthralled with these dive to the heart moments or whatever they you want to call them oh i remember being stoked for this uh, and this one i wasn't like you know i was super excited but i remember i was like oh this is very cool like the fact that the, it is a different image and there's like you know you're fighting nobodies on these things now which i was like okay that's interesting so nobody show up before they try to fight you we get to one of our favorite parts of when we start one of these new games, which is the item selection screen. That's the one. So I looked it up since last time that we talked about this. And uh, the difference is when you do that first selection, when you're fighting against Cypher, all that does is change your stats a little bit. So if you choose the, hmm. the wand, you get plus one magic. You choose the... The one with a guard on it, you get plus one defense and you get plus one strength for prioritizing offense with the sword. And uh, okay, uh, for the second one, though, uh, the second one, this choice that we're now presented with, uh, once again, the sword, the shield and the staff, the choice here affects the order in which you receive abilities based on level up, ah. which is to say that if you get to level ninety nine, you're going to have all the all of the abilities anyway. It's just a matter of what order you obtain them in. Okay, interesting. I'll have to, I'll have to look at the order of the one that I picked. But Kyle, which one did you go with? Well, as I was saying the last time, I enjoy picking the staff for uh, for these games just because I didn't play them with the staff the first times around. I, I was always very mm. physically offense heavy just because I, you know, I didn't know any better. I was, I'll just, I'll just smack it with my sword. Here, I'm trying to, like, explore the magic a little bit more. Maybe I, I, I hopefully even use some of the summons more than I did in the first game. I'd like to actually learn how to use them and use them effectively. So I, I went with magic this time. What, what about you? I'm guessing you probably did. Ooh, if I had to guess. I mean, I, usually you pick the sword. So I'm going to say you pick the sword. I decided this time around because I, you know, I, I like to hit things with I like to hit things really hard, but I wanted to try a version of this game where I could focus on a level balance, but also a lot of team tactics, a lot of using Donald and Goofy as well. So I went with the shield. That sounds like fun. That sounds like fun. That sounds like a good choice. I kind of wish I had done that just because of the fact that we're playing critical. So I. I yeah just to be a little bit more defensive from the beginning. I think that'll be an interesting, like, I, I don't foresee myself. Like, I think I might have to, uh, some of the fights might be a little more difficult, especially some of the boss fights where it's just you versus the boss. And so that'll be tricky, but hopefully it'll balance out that like, maybe my defense will be high enough where I can actually survive without needing to level another 12 times. It, it should work out nicely that you're going to be able to, uh, have better defensive abilities like i was looking at the list and uh it looks like you are gonna get second chance which helps you stay alive when you would normally die uh you're gonna get that at level 49 i'm not gonna get that to level 65 so that's uh <laughs> looking a little hefty Good. here it'll it'll be interesting though you also pick up a lot of uh 
a lot more offensive abilities than I do. First, like my first thing that I get is item boost and then combo boost. And then at one point, I think right after that is experience boost. So I just basically get a bunch of boosts and not a lot of uh, offensive offensive abilities until probably like level 30. Yeah. So I'm honestly just thankful that we all get Leaf Bracer at level 20. There is no changing. That. Yes. Very much looking forward to getting Leaf Bracer as soon as possible. That thing is a lifesaver, man, especially when you're getting mobbed or when you're in the middle of a boss fight. For them to be able to break your healing spells, uh, it sucks so much. So to get it early is a is a blessing. Uh, but you know we get done, so it's, so we can keep just keep moving forward because uh, I feel like we could talk about these oh. abilities all day in our in our selections. Um, we wind up beating a couple of nobodies and we keep fighting a few until we get to this other platform. Um, so, so along the way though, one thing I want to note before we get any farther that I, I just thought this was like a, a fun little detail. Um, as you're going along, it's kind of bringing you through tutorial moments. And every time it shows mm. you a tutorial, it always uses Roxas's name and it kind of leaves this implication that you might be playing Roxas for the entirety of the game. I mean, everybody who saw a commercial for this game ahead of time knows that Sora is playable, is the main character, is on the front of the box. But it's kind of interesting. I wish I could see someone play this game blind, thinking that just Roxas is the new protagonist, goodbye Sora, and and going in deep. I, I, I'd like to see that. That'd be fun. Huh. I actually didn't even remember that. And that that's that if you now that you say that, that's kind of interesting. Because I guess I didn't even pick up on that. It just never really was like a. I, I guess I was just like, oh, maybe they're just talking about Roxas while we're playing as him. Oh, sure, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you can think about it that way. That's the the way to think about it. Sure, but mm. you, if it, if it just refers to Roxas and never says Sora, like, oh, you can go into here and here's where you find Roxas's abilities. I don't know. I just find that mm -hmm. a little interesting. Yeah. No, for sure. Well, that's cool. And but no. So what happens after that? So. Uh, we're finally given the ability to equip those crazy abilities that they give us for playing critical mode. And oddly enough, the door appears, not a door, the door, the door that we saw in dive to the deep or dive to the heart of the first game and never saw again until the final save point at the end of the game. So this is this is definitely a critical moment like that. This door appears. Roxas is seeing this door. And uh, once again, the, the the mysterious voiceless voice says, uh, be careful. Beyond that door lies a completely different world. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, we go through it because otherwise we're just going to stay here all day. Of course. And we wind up on a new platform. And you're kind of standing and looking around. And at this point in all the other in the other games, we were greeted by the giant hulking dark side. The uh, what, what is what we would thought for a long time was like a shadow of Sora. But this time, these gray tendrils kind of appear from nowhere. And this giant hulking, but also very disturbingly snaking form is about a. 50 foot tall nobody with spikes sticking out of his shoulder, his like shoulder plates and kind of like big, what looks like uh, like a spatula shaped hands and feet. And it's just staring you down. Yeah. And it's got a big ninja scarf. And it, it, I think that this really is an equivalent of the dark side boss like this this is the nobody version of the dark side boss so I, I think it's fascinating that roxas fights this enemy yeah to me the most interesting part of this fight was normally these fights just start with all right get to hitting it no 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 this fight begins with that a flash of light and roxas is now suspended in midair shackled his arms and legs wide by what looks like light on each like each one of his joints. And he's you kind of just look around and you're like, oh, God, where did that thing go? I find it super thematic that it holds Roxas in 
the shape of an X. I, I think that's going to be important later. We should hold on to that little detail. Okay. Okay. It's a good, it's a good note. But all of a sudden, the giant nobody in this just absolutely creepy moving ability kind of just snakes itself in front of Roxas, winds its arm back, and as it goes to punch Roxas, you get introduced to one of the new perks of this game, which are the reaction commands. These are so critical, and they, they introduce them excellently, too, because they, they showed already that, oh, yeah, you can use triangle to talk to people. That's the way you do it. You walk up to a shop, you press triangle, whatever you want to do, you just press triangle, and there it is. Here, they're showing it in combat even more so than they had in the, the few fights that you've had with the nobodies. Here, it's being used to to play out a, basically a quick time event. So first you key counter him. So Roxas just kind of like swings a certain way and knocks the enemy back. And then um, I forget exactly how the sequence goes. But the if I remember correctly, it's the enemy tries to punch Roxas. If you time it right, you knock its hand away. Then it gets pissed, gets in your face, throws you into the air and so basically, as you're coming down, it's going to try to hit you. If you time it again correctly, you smack it in the head and it hits the ground. Which, this particular move is called Lunar Salt, I noticed, because I, I, I ran through it the first time and a second time. And I try to pay close attention to the names Lunar Salt. I don't I don't understand the I don't understand anything about this name. The, there's never been a I, I don't either to the moon anywhere in this game that I have noticed other than in Halloween town. So I find it really fascinating that lunar salt is the name that they've settled on for it. Hey, it's these animatics or these like little things are so dope. And I, I you can call them, but you can call them whatever they want. And, but so yeah, as you're coming down, you wind up, if you time it right, you smack it in the head and you land on the, you wind up landing on your feet. And before you can get a hold of it to hit it again, it, does this really just spooky, basically kind of snakes itself backwards off the edge of the platform. And you, you go back to like, OK, where did this thing just go? I remember some I walked up to the edge and right as you walk up to the edge, the platform gets smacked up from the bottom and Roxas is going to fall and he manages to stick his keyblade in the, the bottom of the platform right before falling off. And you turn the corner and see that this thing had been upside down under the platform, making what I can only describe as a Dragon Ball Z spirit bomb. That is exactly what it is. Yeah. And Roxas, let's go, starts to fall. The, the entire, it's so weird, the entire arena basically flips back right side up. And as this thing is being launched at you, if you time it just right, you throw the keyblade at it, it explodes. And Roxas, of course, you know, gets doesn't get hit by the full explosion, but gets like knocked back and kind of unconscious for a quick second. He hits the platform. And then a moment later, the our giant nobody hits the platform, having had that thing ex blow up in his face. You get up. And then you proceed to whack him in the head a couple times. And then this entire thing happens again. Um, sort of. Yeah, it, it's a weird fight. It, well, outside of, you know, there are um, there are like uh, one or two other phases of how this thing attacks you in between. And but I know it, it's kind of hard to really describe that over an auditory medium. <laughs> Yeah, the it's these like tendrils come out. And you have to counter to avoid them. They're like tendrils, but also projectiles. And you have to like just keep de skirting around them. And and there's other enemies that spawn that are mostly there to give you hit points back because you got hit too many times. It, it's a, I, I, but yeah, it, it, this fight is all about the the uh, the animatics and all that. Like the just those those little reaction timers and just feeling cool this fight is completely designed to feel cool and boy did they succeed yeah uh, dude it's it's a it's an, an amazing introduction to what you can kind of expect going forward and i am all kinds of here for it 
So you put the enemy into the ground. You fight it to the death. And at the same time, though, you kind of uh, start losing yourself to the darkness all the same. And Namine steps in the last second and saves him from the dark. Namine does like actually reach in and pull him out of this. And she looks at him or she tells him, I mean, do you know your true name? And Ida Rox is just like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And at this point, uh, the uh, the hooded figure that we've been seeing comes in and says, uh, stops Namine from asking that and says it's best if he doesn't know the truth. Then he just makes a portal, picks up Roxas and throws him in it. Uh, but one thing that I do want to point out is that I think that maybe this scene takes place in Castle Oblivion. I only say that because if you look in the background, you can see shapes that look just like the cards from Castle Oblivion. Did you catch that? Ah, no, I didn't. I did not catch that. So I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, it would make sense for that to be the case because the flower pod was somewhere at the top of Castle Oblivion. So I guess it would make sense for other things to be taking place there. And that Castle Oblivion is still a real place somewhere, maybe. Mm hmm. But yeah. Anyway, so huh, okay. yeah, uh, Roxas gets tossed out of there back into Twilight Town. Yeah, he definitely does. I can't remember exactly what happened in between there. I, I just put down there's some friendship nonsense between the kids. Yeah, it's it's just because they, they guilt trip him for missing the beach because they didn't go to the beach without Roxas. And it's just Ah, uh, that's what it was. They keep harping on it, man. They they keep making this poor kid feel so bad. Like I feel bad for Roxas here just in like social expectations and he's not able to live up to anything. He's disappointed his friends three days in a row here, basically. Yeah. What happens after that actually is I found definitely more interesting is that we cut away to inside Diz's lap where Diz is pissed and is enraged that Nomine ha he says hack the data and managed to jump into his world. Which just kind of confirms that theory that we're that we're working on that like this must be a digital world or something like they keep talking about data. They keep talking about. All these things, uh, it, it, it sure sounds like, you know, especially with Diz being at a computer constantly, it sure sounds like this is a digital world and that Nominee is somehow wreaking havoc inside of it against Diz's will. Yeah, that definitely. And so not only is she apparently some kind of memory witch, but she's also a uh, expert computer hacker. Fellas, find you a gal who can do both. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Oh, that was that was really good. I like that a lot. Oh, goodness gracious. So, OK, so anyway, um, uh, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think with that, that might be where we want to call it for today. Yeah, I think that that was that is a really good stopping point before we get into uh, the next bit, which, as we all know, the next day we're going to be getting into the struggle tournament. Genuinely so excited to play that again. I I really think that struggle is one of my favorite parts of Kingdom Hearts 2 for no good reason. But I, I just wish that I could play struggle again. I wish you, I wish they would allow we'll get into it. But yeah, if they, if they would allow you to go back and play against bosses of Kingdom Hearts 2 in struggle. Exactly. Something like the Olympus Coliseum, but it's struggle tournaments. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, that would, well, we'll, 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 have, we'll have a full episode of talking about it because it, it is a very fun part. But. Uh, that is it for this week, everybody. Thank you so much for listening in. Kyle, dude, as always, I am so excited to keep going down this Kingdom Hearts 2 rabbit hole with you. And I am so excited to keep being the champion of minigames. <laughs> shut, shut, shut up. <laughs> I'm the king of anyway, games now, Yugi. No! Okay, we will see you all next week back here on Dream Drop Long Distance. See you all next week, everybody. Hey there, Kingdom Hearts fans. Thanks for listening to the episode. Dream Drop Long Distance is hosted by Mitchell Orsino and Kyle Bradshaw and is produced by Kyle Bradshaw. Our theme music was written and recorded by Alex McLean.